Today we are joined by Gopa Kumar and Lauren Paramore uh, to discuss and tell us about what happened uh, in the World Health Assembly uh, regarding the IHR and what does it mean uh, when we say that the, it has, the negotiations have concluded and we have certain amendments in place. Uh, just to tell you all, IHR first, that is the International Health Regulations that came into place in 2005 uh, and uh, there, the amendments were uh, suggested in the light of COVID-19 pandemic and uh, what uh, were the amendments, the major ones that were proposed uh, in the IHR and uh, when it has been concluded after so much of back and forth, especially between the developed and the developing countries, where do we stand with those amendments? Uh, Gopa, maybe you can begin with that. Thank you, Jochna. Um, uh, <laughs> So one of the important criticism um, in the context of uh, IHR was that it has a colonial legacy and the colonial legacy is uh, um, by and large uh, coming from the fact that uh, there was nothing in the IHR to address the equity issues or the vast inequities existing uh, in the context of health emergency preparedness and response. There was nothing uh, concrete, though it recognizes the development divide, but there was uh, nothing concrete uh, in the uh, IHR to address these issues, especially the equitable access of health products. So this was the major uh, criticism against uh, uh, IHR, as well as uh, there was no financial mechanism to assist the implementation of IHR. So uh, these uh, amendments um, uh, makes an attempt uh, to address these uh, issues and the final outcome shows that uh, there is an incremental uh, progress in the uh, IHR and it has been uh, uh, able to uh, make a sincere attempt uh, uh, to uh, recognize this problem as well as to provide certain, um, I would say, uh, actionable provisions uh, which has the potential to address this. Of course, uh, we will come to know whether these uh, IHR, these provisions are going to work or not in the real context. But uh, now um, uh, there is a recognition of the fact that equity and solidarity are important uh, ways to implement the IHR. And second, uh, it recognizes the fact that uh, um, there is a need uh, to address equitable access. And third, it imposes an obligation on WHO uh, to address these issues. And it also imposes an obligation on member state. Of course, it is qualified, but to help WHO in achieving the equitable access. And lastly, uh, it also... Uh, address uh, this is the issue of finance for the implementation. It basically mandate creating a financial mechanism and giving a mandate for the financial mechanism to work uh, to mobilize the resources for the implementation. Thank you, Gopal. Uh, so maybe, Lauren, if you, uh, I can come to you and ask, uh, so are these amendments now that we have certain, uh, has that made IHR a stronger instrument uh, to deliver equity and in what way uh, or has it not been able to do that? And is there something that should have happened even more to ensure that it is a stronger instrument for social justice and equity? Thanks, Jotsna. So I think the, I think the IHR is stronger than it was, um, as Gopa mentioned. There's explicit recognition of equity and solidarity. That was the mandate that was given to the working group. And they tried to deliver on that to some extent. So, for example, um, through creating a financing mechanism that can help strengthen core capacities, for example. So at least one thing that's happened is that there is a financing mechanism that can help uh, member states to do the basics um, and that new unfunded mandates have not necessarily been created. So that's, a, I would say, significant, even if it's modest. Um, the principle of solidarity is explicitly recognized in the text. Uh, I think that's important. 
um, because in the uh, INP, the pandemic accord negotiations, uh, we've seen that Global North countries have made attempts to erase that principle um, from some of the, the later versions of the draft text. So I think this idea that countries have uh, common but differentiated obligations with respect to health emergencies is important. Um, and then maybe I would say, I think uh, it's an important symbolic victory that some of these equity and solidarity principles have been defended successfully because I think um, many southern states, the Africa bloc in particular, were quite emphatic that equity should be included in the revisions, that it should be actionable, that it should be explicit. So I think what's happened is that in a sense, it's been a validation of the multilateral process. And I think that's something symbolically that's important because in many other forums, um, that process is being questioned. In WHO itself, it's been questioned in light of the influence of uh, big business um, and how uh, they risk shaping WHO's agenda. So I think that's important. Good to hear. There, uh, despite uh, what we keep seeing happening in Geneva, where uh, the issues of developing countries get defeated uh, and what civil society stands for, there is some progress. Uh, but you were also talking about... Uh, uh, the finances and financial mechanism. Now, we know that uh, under the pandemic treaty, the discussion is where uh, the funds will be hosted by the World Bank, where actually the member states do not have uh, a control. Uh, but uh, under IHR, what are we seeing and what does uh, that kind of a financial mechanism mean uh, when it comes to emergencies? And I would just like to remind our viewers, it is uh, when we talk about emergencies, it is not only uh, pandemic related emergencies. Emergencies is a much broader term. It means uh, the kind of floods we saw in Pakistan. It means the kind of earthquake we saw in Turkey. It can mean a very, very varied forms of emergencies that uh, happen at certain points in the world and requires immediate health response uh so so in that sense yeah what does the fund mean and what is this financial mechanism and how do we see it so the uh, article 44 um uh, this uh, new article has been uh, inserted in uh, in the ihr and that uh, our particular article establishes a coordinated financial mechanism. It says uh, a coordinated financial mechanism is hereby established too, and then set out its function. So one of the uh, uh, function, there are three functions listed. So the function C is basically to say to work to mobilize new and additional financial resources and increase the efficient utilization of existing financial instruments relevant to the effective implementation of these regulations. So one of the important demands of developing countries uh, was to create a dedicated fund <coughs> under IHR to fi finance the implementation because uh, all these existing mechanisms, um, uh, like including the World Bank Fund, they are not accountable to the uh, WHO. So uh, this uh, demand for a dedicated fund was opposed by developing uh, developed countries and the compromise now reached is a coordinated financial mechanism but that financial mechanism has um, uh, <coughs> uh, financial mechanism has um, a mandate uh, work to mobilize new and additional financial resources. Uh, so I think um, you know um, uh, this is a very, very important uh, uh, provision. And also, uh, I would like to uh, uh, draw your attention to one more article that, that is not related to finance, but important in the context of uh, uh, the equitable access. Uh, this particular article uh, is 13.8, uh, uh, Article 13.8. Uh, this gives a very... Um, clear legal obligation or, or legal mandate for WHO to address access to uh, the issue of access to health products. Uh, it, 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 it reads, WHO shall facilitate and work to remove barriers to timely and equitable access by state parties to relevant health products after the determination and during a public health emergency of international concern, including a pandemic emergency. 
so there is a clear obligation on WHO to uh, to to step in. This was completely missing from um, and the earlier IHR and earlier IHR basically, as we always call it as a colonial legacy, because once the member states inform them and the WHO take it uh, that information and make an assessment and declare a PHAC, there was no role for uh, there was no uh, role for WHO to assist the member states, or there was no obligation to put it in uh, you know legally um, legal language. Uh, and there was no obligation on mem other member states also to assist uh, a country facing these uh, 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 disease outbreaks uh, to uh, be provided with uh, uh, to, uh, uh, health products or assist uh, uh, that countries contain that uh, outbreak. Absolutely. So it seems like that IHR he's, has been able to conclude uh, many of the debates uh, and concerns that still surround the pandemic treaty. And we know that uh, the pandemic treaty negotiations did not conclude this time. Uh, there's one more year to work on it. Uh, do you think that these uh, the, uh, the, um, these amendments to IHR, some of them uh, are so positive in nature, that is going to impact the way pandemic treaty negotiations go in future, uh, will it really aid the developing countries to say that now that it is already in black and white, we need to adapt it to the pandemic treaty also because ultimately you cannot have two instruments uh, which are contradictory in nature in certain uh, uh, articles. Uh, so will that aid the countries or uh, not? Any of you can take this question, yes. Hey, Lauren, you can start and then I'll come in. Um, I don't think so. I think um, it won't necessarily um, harm the IMP process in the sense that, for example, if principles of equity and solidarity were not overtly acknowledged in the IHR text, that would have been bad for the IMP. I think in relation to those principles, it makes it a little bit easier to argue that you should then, therefore, for consistency, also include them in the IMB process. Um, so, so in that sense, I think they they could work well together to amplify some of the demands of developing states. I think there are other issues that maybe are a little bit more exclusive to the INB that will remain controversial. So for example, the debate around pathogen access and benefit sharing. Um, continues to be controversial. Uh, it's not necessarily something I think uh, that will be assisted by the negotiations in the IHR because this issue is, is not directly addressed in the IHR. Um, that said, the fact that the IHR um, does create a space for WHO to facilitate, for example, um, technology sharing, technology transfer, those are not necessarily bad things. Uh, we've seen some developing countries asking for tech transfer, for example, as a, a kind of benefit that should be accompanying a PEB system. Um, those have not been very popular with global North countries, but you know, so there's a way in which maybe IHR could offer support in the IMB process, but to me, it's not uh, clear um, how exactly that will play out. Would you have something to yeah, add? Yeah. I definitely um, uh, agree with um, uh, Lauren's uh, statement that actually the uh, IHR um, recognized solidarity and uh, equity and it has certain provisions to operationalize those uh, uh, concepts. Um, so therefore, uh, uh, the IHR can actually amplify uh, uh, the IH, the these IHR provisions can actually to help to amplify these concepts uh, further in the pandemic instrument because what we are talking in the pandemic instrument is a, a not uh, a public health emergencies of international concern. It's a pandemic emergency. That's much more elevated form of PHEIC. Uh, so much more critical situations and affecting uh, much more people and much more uh, countries. Um, uh, so therefore, the uh, to address such situation, you need much more stronger provisions 
uh, and much more uh, stronger measures um, uh, and especially in the context of uh, equity and uh, um, uh, for finance so i would say that um, the conclusion of ihr brings more clarity and uh, it gives an opportunity to amplify some of these uh, uh, concepts of solidarity and equity much uh, better way uh, in the instrument and also to address the gap uh, in the ihr that is the access and benefit sharing system that is going to be addressed through the um, so uh, both these instruments supposed to uh, work in a complementary way but for that the most important thing is the uh, we need to determine the legal nature of the pandemic instrument the uh, whole uh, mainstream approach is to consider this instrument as a separate treaty under article 19 of the who constitution if you do that then the complementarity get affected because under article 19 um, requires ratification Uh, by the member state to be uh, part of the instrument so member states may pick and choose uh, they may not ratify the pandemic instrument thank you lauren you wanted to add yes yes i uh, maybe just to say that something that i think um is helpful in the ihr is that the definition of health products includes health technologies and i think this is important there's a lot of fighting around what should be included the definition of health technologies and i think it will help my like, co-pa said to provide clarity also for the um the imp process and then i think also important is um that access to health services is recognized as a core capacity in the ihr and i think this is important because even though a pandemic is an extreme event of course you need certain basic uh, infrastructure to respond to it equitably and effectively and so i think the fact that the ihr recognizes uh, health system strengthening as a core capacity is important also for the imb process particularly from the perspective of developing countries so it's not only for example that they should invest in pathogen surveillance it's also a legitimate investment to uh, invest in health system strengthening and i think for um, developing states that's been a big um, point of emphasis throughout the process uh i think we've covered a lot but just lastly i just want to have a sense of how things really uh moved uh, in the past few months um if we ha- uh we have some anecdote or something how the uh, because developing uh, developed countries initially were not ready to give in into a lot of things and now what we have is so much better what kind of roles certain countries played to ensure that we do have a better uh, instrument in place and which were those countries who would have completely opposed it and still finally we have what we have so so the role of certain specific countries maybe it will be good to know uh, how it has helped we have arrived at what we have yeah um, and also what happened during the who with regard to this uh, if there's some spice there i think you know there was uh, some apprehensions uh, uh, from the very beginning uh, because uh, uh, there are two processes right or there were two processes one is the ihr amendment and the, uh, and another is the inb amendment so mm-hmm. the countries who are investing more on ihr thought that okay if any progress in inb will affect ihr Uh, or the people countries who invested more uh, in the inb process thought that any progress in the ihr would affect uh, inb so this has uh, sort of this dynamics uh, played a role uh, in the whole negotiations but by march uh, uh, it became very clear that uh, uh, there is some progress going to be some progress in the um, Uh, in the ihr uh, precisely because uh, the proposals came from um, uh, the bureau but by and large i think it's uh, uh, also uh, prepared by the uh, uh, the coaches uh, in discussion with the bureau and the secretariat so let's call it as a bureau specs uh, uh, 
so the bureau's text um, gave a kind of a confidence in the process. It boosted the confidence in the IHR uh, uh, process because the working group bureau um, refused to circulate a text prepared by the secretariat, which was reinforcing the status quo on equity. And this is in opposition to the INB Bureau's uh, approach. INB Bureau never allowed a kind of a text-based negotiation. They all the time were preparing the text and which was uh, um, off the mark of uh, majority of the um, member states uh, uh, wanted to see, especially I'm saying majority of the uh, member states means developing country states, especially on UKT. Uh, and finance. Uh, uh, so that's that's made the difference, I think. Uh, Lauren, you were there for the World Health Assembly uh, this time. Uh, what did you sense from the beginning and do you think that's what came through uh, when it comes to IHR? Sense? Yeah, I'm, I agree with you. I think my sense was that the IHR process um, was defined maybe by uh, a bit more trust um, and openness than the INP process. Maybe also it helped, for example, that from the beginning of the process, um, the proposals of member states were publicly accessible, so you could see on the website what was being proposed and so on. Um, you know, when the US first proposed revisions to the IHR, there was a lot of emphasis on increasing access to information and, and kind of being able to go in and get the data that was needed to respond to a public health emergency, I think. It also helped that that language kind of got toned down throughout the process. Um, because again, um, these conversations took place in a kind of bigger context. It was also an assembly that was marked by um, extensive discussions around what's happening in Palestine. Um, so I think that presented a kind of crisis for multilateralism. Um, and something I think um, maybe also to consider is that, uh, of course, the DG's term is coming to a close. And also, as a DG, you want to deliver on something um, impressive as part of your legacy. So I think. Uh, all these maybe contributed to creating a bit more momentum for the IHR. Also, the IHR is already binding, um, and so that too is important because whatever changes come into effect, like Opa said, um, will for the most part be implemented unless states take out reservations. So, thank you so much. And uh, I think the takeaway would be that, yeah, we have uh, a better and a stronger uh, IHR instrument. Uh, and um, But what brought it through is transparency and the fact that every country could play the role that it should. Um, and we can only hope that in further negotiations, especially with regard to pandemic treaty, uh, we are able to see the same in the uh, coming one year. Uh, and let's see how that moves. Uh, thank you so much, Gopa. Thank you so much, uh, Lauren. And I would also like to acknowledge that uh, the role that Third World Network and People's Health Movement have played in these all these negotiations and in IHR, it's commendable.